Hello. Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, made in 1982, has, with the passage of time, become a cult movie so warmly embraced by its vast army of fans that it's hard to believe that it wasn't a huge success on its original release. Reviews were mixed. One major critic carped that the film has a narrative so lame that it seems in need of a wheelchair. And then there was that narration that evoked film noir, but which both Scott and Harrison Ford claimed in interviews they never really wanted. Ten years after the original release, a so-called director's cut was discovered and released, and this had no narration and a different, darker ending. Suckers like me, who acquired copies of the film on home video, were regularly offered new, allegedly more integral versions. The Blu-ray copy that sits on my shelf has no less than five different versions of the film. And so the legend has grown, and so has anticipation for the long-awaited sequel, directed by French-Canadian Denis Villeneuve, who made the excellent Arrival, and with Ridley Scott as one of the executive producers, presumably there to keep a watchful eye. Critics who attended the advanced screenings of Blade Runner 2049 were requested by Villeneuve not to give away too much of the plot, which is fair enough. Suffice to say that the new film unfolds 30 years after the events of the original, and that the Blade Runner, a license to kill policemen assigned to track down and exterminate rogue replicants or robots that look exactly like humans, is now played by Ryan Gosling, and is known only by the number and the letter K. Unlike Harrison Ford's Rick Deckard in the original, there seems no doubt that K is himself a replicant, though of a very superior variety. Under instructions from his boss, Lieutenant Joshi, Robin Wright, Kay is hunting down Nexus 8 replicants, the one that caused the trouble 30 years earlier. They've now been replaced by more pliable Nexus 9, like Kay's girlfriend, Joy, Anna de Armas. We're told in the opening titles that the Tyrell Corporation, the company that manufactured the Nexus 8 replicants in the past, has long gone out of business, and that a new tycoon, Nyanda Wallace, Jared Leto, who made his fortune by mastering synthetic farming, now controls the Nexus 9 replicants. Wallace, who is blind, lives in one of the most extraordinary dwellings ever seen in a movie, and his ruthless assistant, Love, Sylvie Hooks, carries out his orders without question. Now that's all I'll say about the plot, except to note that since he's prominently featured in the advertising material, it's no revelation to report that Harrison Ford's Decker does eventually make an appearance, though you do have to wait quite a while for this to occur. The original Blade Runner was famously inspired by sci-fi writer Philip K. Dick's wonderful short story, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Perhaps one reason the 1982 film puzzled so many people was that some key elements of the story were left out. For example, the fact that in this future society, animals have almost completely disappeared. An important plot point Ridley Scott chose to ignore which was odd given that facsimiles of animals, a paper unicorn in the first film, a carved wooden horse in the second, play such important roles in the drama. One element of the original film is that just about everybody agreed on was the way it looked. Los Angeles in 2019 had been affected by climate change to the extent that it was permanently raining. The city had also become Asianized and looked more like Hong Kong than La La Land. In 2049, the environment has visibly declined still further. The atmosphere looks foul and polluted, and the disposal of garbage has clearly become a major problem. San Diego has been transformed into a giant garbage dump. There are prominent ads for Sony, the parent company of Columbia, the film's distributors, for Coca-Cola, for Peugeot, the manufacturer of the flying cars that Blade Runners use, and even for the long defunct Pan American Airways. That's an odd inclusion, and maybe it's an in-joke. Just as Scott did in the original film, Villeneuve adopts an unhurried pace, and some may find the plot rather too dense and convoluted. Probably it will take more than one viewing to make complete sense of it. Meanwhile, Gosling's quiet interior performance impresses, as does the vigour with which Ford, in his belated appearance, reinvigorates one of his most famous screen characters. It's pretty difficult not to keep referring to the original film when talking about the new one, but one last point of comparison should be noted. In 1982, Ford's battle against the rogue replicants ran for a little under two hours, 118 minutes. 
Gosling's journey lasts considerably longer, just over two hours and 40 minutes. It's probably too long, but it's visually so exciting that I doubt many will care about that. The end credits reveal that the film was produced in several different countries, among them Hungary, Iceland, New Zealand, India, Canada, and even the USA. It's certainly an impressive achievement, and I'm looking forward to a second viewing, and I'm giving it four stars. <laughs>